Good morning, everybody. Welcome to New Horizons Fellowship. We're so glad to have those who are here present in the room with us. And I want to say Happy Resurrection Sunday. I still call it Easter because I don't know. I just always called it Easter, and um, but I know what I know what I'm saying when I say that. And we do, we do rejoice in in the eternal resurrection life of our Lord, and also in coming to see how we participate in that. Amen, because his victory is our victory. And as I like to say, Easter is a participation sport. Resurrection Sunday is something that we are all invited to participate in, and we'll talk about that today. Amen, but I have a scripture that uh, really came to my heart to share with you, and we do welcome all of our folks on our YouTube channel. What a pleasure to have you with us, and to you also we say, Happy Resurrection Sunday. I'm so glad that you're with us today. I'm going to read a couple of verses that I haven't really looked at in uh, quite a long time, um, but they come from uh, Philippians uh, chapter 2, and uh, you will remember these verses, I'm sure, about the Lord, I'm starting with verse 5 of Philippians 2. It says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. That's sort of a funny, I don't know why they translated it that way. I never understood what that meant. But when I studied into the Greek more, what it really means is that Jesus did not consider his equality with God something to be clung to or jealously guarded. That makes a lot more sense, doesn't it? In other words, he was willing to give up his divine position to come as a man. And so that makes a lot more sense. I never understood it the other way. Who being in the form of God did not consider it, consider it robbery to be equal with God. He didn't consider his equality with God something to jealously guard and cling to. He was willing to let it go and come as a man is what that really means. And it's proven by the next verses. Verse 8 says, And being found in appearance as a man, there it is, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even the death of the cross. Now here's the key that we're going to talk about today. Uh, the subtitle of the message today is, What's in a name? What's in a name? So it says, Jesus submitted to all that humbled himself to becoming a man, but also to the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. So truly Easter, Resurrection Sunday, is about receiving a new name. It was for Jesus, and it is for all of us. He's given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess, hallelujah, that Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen? So we're going to praise him today, as I'm sure you have already gathered. Uh, Greet one another if you haven't already done so. I think you pretty well did. If you're able to rise up on your feet to praise him, please do. And if you're more comfortable sitting down, of course, there's liberty in the house of God. Praise his name. And I do want to just say again to everyone, happy Resurrection Sunday. What a glorious celebration it is. Amen. So join us. We're going to start out with one of our favorite Easter hymns. And it's called I'll Fly Away. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore.
clap would you? He is worthy, 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 worthy. Amen. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Glory to God. to know that we will never taste death. We will just step from this realm of lesser glory into his arms of greater glory. Mm -hmm. Let me thank you for that, Lord. And I often think of uh, a very simple passage that the Lord gave me to explain the gospel because I've apologized many times to the Lord for being so complex sometimes. Do you ever desire that simplicity? And uh, so this song talks about all that is ours because of blood, and because of Jesus' glorious resurrection. And the way the Lord gave it to me to explain it is that his cross has handled our past and his resurrection has handled our future. I just said, Lord, thank you. It just cut my verbiage down by 90% just to say that the Jesus' cross has fully handled our past, and we all have one. Jesus' resurrection has made all provision for our future. Amen? And uh, that's what this next song is all about. His blood avails for me. Amen? And let's just celebrate together the fullness, as I said, His resurrection has made all provision for our future. Amen? Hallelujah. Not 
nothing else compares my plan, but Jesus touches me. His blood avails, His blood avails, His blood avails for me. From every need, now His blood I plead, His blood avails for me. that your shed blood combined with your glorious resurrection has provided for all of our needs. Amen. Our past, our present, and our eternal future. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. There's just something so powerful about saying thank you, Lord Jesus, for the power of your blood. It's so simple. It so takes the focus off of us and our performance and onto his perfect performance that we trust in by faith. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. And I guess you might call this our Easter song. It, it uh, was composed by our dear friend Steve Adams. And uh, it just to us, it just has Resurrection Sunday all over it. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> In everything great, in everything smooth, from the stars to my heart, the glory is yours. When I am unable, you cause me to stand. Thank you. 
exalt you today, Lord. Amen. In his beauty, in his holiness. And I just have such a sense of our being a part of God's larger kingdom, his larger family, and his larger praise team. Today I can just almost hear the angels glorifying him in heaven with his names and his titles. And let's continue to do that. What, what would you praise him for being in your life? Give, give him some Easter Resurrection Sunday praise. My oh, Savior. The Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. What did you say, Lynn? My Savior. My Savior. Amen. It's hard to top that. Right? The great I am that I am. What did you say again, Janet? Behold the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. And that goes so beautifully with what Lynn said, our Savior. Praise him. He has risen. Yes. Amen. That he is risen. He is alive. Amen. Thank the author you. of life. The author. Did you say of life? Author of life. Author of life. Amen, Herb. Thank our you. soon coming king. Our soon coming king. Thank you, Lord. We praise you this morning. Amen. We give him the glory due his name. Thank you, Lord, that you are resurrection life. Mm -hmm. Amen. You are. Today I'm calling him the God of glorious name changes. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Our God who gave Jesus the name which is above every name. Mm -hmm. Amen. And now think about what, what are we called? We're called Christians, believers in Messiah. We have been now christened with his name. What does it mean to christen even is to anoint, right? It comes from the word Christ. We have now been given a new name. We've been named with the name of Yeshua, the name of Jesus. We have received a new name, a new identity. Amen. So we praise you for that, Lord, today. What else would you thank him for being in your life? Preserver of our souls. Yes, Lord. Yes, you are the preserver, protector of our souls. My healer. My healer, yes, Lynn. Our wisdom. May our wisdom, that's right, the source, the fountain of wisdom, right, Marion? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord. Praise you today. Our merciful God. Our merciful God, our God of all mercy. Yes, you are. The one who gives us peace. The one who gives us peace. That's right. One of his names that I just love so much is Yahweh Shalom. Mm -hmm. Right, the Lord our peace. And then, of course, Jesus is the Prince of Peace, our Shalom. Amen. And we know Shalom is such, dare I call it a pregnant word. It's so full. I told you this story before. I was uh, playing music for a Jewish group, and uh, there was a, a gentleman who just raised his hand, which hardly ever happened in a concert. And he said, he said, Mr. Young, can I tell you what Shalom means? And he was, he was not a Messianic believer. He was just a Jewish man who knew, knew his Hebrew. And he just began to go on and on about what shalom. I just said, preach it, brother. I didn't say that, but that's what I, that's what I felt like. He just said, I just had to tell you what shalom, because I sang a song about shalom for them. Uh, and uh, he said, I just have to tell you what it means. And so, Lord, we thank you that you are our shalom, the Prince of Peace. And, and Lord, today in, in a, time of such great conflict and disturbance worldwide, Lord, we yeah. so cry out to Yahweh Shalom, Sar Shalom, mm -hmm. Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, the Prince of Peace, the Prince of Shalom. Lord, all that it encompasses we need today in our world. Amen. And many of those qualities you all just praised him for. Savior, healer, redeemer, provider, protector, the one who brings peace, but in a, in a larger sense, the word really means well-being of, of every sort, of every form. So we praise you for that today. Amen. It says in various places that, that his peace comes through, through the blood. Amen. It says, in fact, in, in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, we've quoted it many times, right? Where it says, the chastisement for our shalom was upon him. He was chastised. He suffered. He poured out his blood. He suffered in his passion beyond description. But then in being raised from the dead, he gave us his victory so that we can participate in his shalom. Amen. The chastisement for our shalom was upon him. 
and by his stripes, by the blows that cut into him, we are healed and made whole. In fact, that, that, that verse, Isaiah 53, 5, is so stunning, uh, as we've talked about many times, when you really look at what the Hebrew says, it's even more descriptive than it seems. So let me quote it to you, really uh, expanding on what the Hebrew actually says. It says that he was wounded and pierced through for our transgressions. The Hebrew actually says pierced through. He was wounded and pierced through for our transgressions. He was bruised and crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement for our shalom was upon him. And by his stripes, by the blows that cut into him, that's what the Hebrew literally says, by his stripes, by the blows that cut into him, as Lynn said, we are healed and made whole. Amen. And I, I just, I can't speak that verse out loud without saying it again as a praise because it's just a, an unavoidable, irresistible praise ushers forth from my heart. So I just want to say again, and I release this word to you, dear ones in this room right now, and the, the many that are, are watching on YouTube. I just want to say thank you, Yeshua. Thank you and praise you, Jesus, that you were wounded and pierced through for my transgressions, personally, for our transgressions. Thank you, Jesus, you were bruised and crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement for our shalom was upon you. Thank you for suffering that by your stripes. Lord, by the blows that cut into you, we are healed and made whole. Amen. We receive that today. We receive that today with thanksgiving. Hallelujah. Well, I wanted to focus our, our prayers in a, in a special way today uh, for our families. Did, do you all have families? I think you do. I'm pretty sure you do. And some verses occurred to me uh, that happened not long before Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane and eventually was arrested. But I want to pray these over your families today. And uh, I'm quite certain if your family is like my family, there's a need for, for more love. There's always a need for more love, more unity. Uh, at times, family relationships can need uh, reconciliation, forgiveness, healing, humility, all the things that can help families be more unified and more loving. So just a couple verses occurred to me. Uh, the first is a commandment from the Lord in, in John 13. You don't need to turn there. I'll just share it with you. In John 13, 34, Jesus says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. I just love our Lord that love is the most essential thing to him. Love is the main focus, and certainly in families, it's so important to the Lord and to us. Then he says, by, all, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And so, like me, you may have asked yourself, Lord, how can I have more of that love for my family and uh, for the Lord and, and for one another? And just a little bit earlier in John 13 <coughs> is... Uh, the story of Jesus washing feet. Do you remember that story? Mm -hmm. And I always find that so astounding. You know, we read about it, and, and, and sometimes we've had foot washings, which are, which are wonderful, they're powerful. Um, but sometimes we forget that in, in the Jewish household of the time, it was the lowest servant on the totem pole that washed feet. So when Jesus girded himself and prepared to wash feet, this was not a small shocker, this was a giant shocker. Right, which is one of the reasons Peter, with a little bit of foot and mouth disease, uh, said, you know, far be it, you'll never wash me, right? And then Jesus said, well, if, if I don't wash you, referring to, really to his blood, you will have no part in me. But I thought about where does that ability, we're talking about, I'm going to bless your families today, talking about love, loving our families with, Jesus says, as I have loved you, so love one another. So I want to get a clue, where did he come up with that love? And of course we know because he, he was and is God. But yet there's something that we can see a little bit earlier in uh, chapter 13 of John. It says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God 
and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. And so that astonishing representation of love and to me it just so applies to families because some people in our families have dirty feet don't they at times life, life can dirty feet sometimes we have dirty feet and we need people not to criticize the way our feet look and smell but to be willing to wash them and I thought that was a beautiful picture of love in the family because because living with someone day in and day out decade in decade out can be a challenge and that, that notion of washing one another's feet, not, not complaining about the burden that we present to each other, but being willing to wash feet. So I asked the Lord, Lord, please incite me as to where that comes from so that I too might be a washer of feet. And the clue I believe is in verse three of John 13. It says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, then he rose from supper and prepared to wash feet. And God quickened that to me, right? First of all, it says that Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, Jesus knew what he had. But it said that also that, that he had not only given all things into his hands, but that he had come from God. In other words, Jesus knew who he was and whose he was, right? He knew all that he had, all that was his, because he was and is the Son of God, but he also knew, knew who he was and whose he was, knew, knowing he had come from God. And then the last thing he knew was where he was going and that he was going back to the Father. And I thought to myself, couldn't that be a key for us to, to become a little bit more prone to foot washing, that we would remember all that is ours because we've been gathered into Jesus that we remember who we are because Jesus lives in us and whose we are and ultimately where we are headed, where we are going and that, that our love and care for our, each other and our families would be framed in, in the terms of, uh, of eternal verities, eternal truths, eternal priorities. Lord, I wanna pray, amen. When I come across that, I say, Lord, I need you. I need grace for this foot washing business. Let's bow our heads. Lord, today you just put it on my heart to share this as a prelude to blessing our families. And so maybe many of us will be getting together with family members today or talking on the phone. Lord, I, I just recognize the, the astonishing love that the Father poured out through Jesus that he would wash feet, our feet, symbolizing the washing of his shed blood as we trust him to forgive our sins and to grant us eternal life. Lord, we acknowledge many times we, we don't wash feet, we criticize feet. We measure feet and, and calculate their lack of comeliness, their unseemliness. Forgive us today, Lord. May, may that love that Jesus demonstrated so powerfully just shortly before he went to the garden and was ultimately arrested shortly before his passion. He said, let me show you a picture here of what love is all about. And as he handled their feet, I'm sure it was astonishing to them that he took the position of the, the lowest servant in the household. And as he handled their feet, beloved, can you imagine the anointing of love that went through his hands and touched perhaps the dustiest, dirtiest part of their bodies. Lord, may we be those who would wash feet, not in criticism and judgment, but in the willingness to love, even in our families, even especially in our families. Fill us with your ability to love, even to the point of washing feet. And we'll be careful, Lord, to give you all the glory as they come to see and experience your love through our actions, and then want to get to know Jesus who is loving them through us. And we pray this blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you agree with me for that? Yes. Maybe we'll have a foot washing again. Uh, have you all ever experienced foot, foot washings? 
uh, we've uh, we've had him a couple of times in a couple of different churches that I've ministered at, and uh, it's very very powerful. It's surprisingly powerful. It's a little embarrassing. Uh, you take your socks off and you share your feet with one another in all their glory. Um, but but then as the foot washing begins, there is a holy anointing of the servant's heart of Yeshua, of Jesus, that just comes on you, and you're amazed at the anointing that that comes. So that's a commercial for a foot washing to come, no doubt. It's very, very, very powerful. Well, hey, why don't we worship the Lord with our giving? If you need an offering envelope, uh, raise your hand, and Herb will very kindly envelop you with the love of the Lord. Amen. And it's so good to, to have you with us. And again, I want to say happy Resurrection Sunday. I'm really excited about the message today. As I said, it's going to be entitled, What's in a Name? And, and we're going to look at uh, the power of God's naming and the power of God's renaming. Amen. Amen. And uh, Herb, I would love to hear you bless the offering, brother, if you've got a blessing in you for it. We just thank you, Father, that we can come before you and we'd have nothing to bring to us. You have provided it for us and you sustained us and keep us. So we just thank you for that and we just lift up all that you receive back to multiply it and increase it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, Herb. And we bless the offering today and um, just remind those of you watching on YouTube that uh, we're going to be sharing communion in just a little while. If you want to prepare elements for yourself, we invite you to participate uh, and share in that. And also, if uh, this ministry has been a blessing to you and you would like to support us, it's an encouragement and helps us to continue with our ministries uh, here and around the world as we minister in the Ukraine and the Philippines and Pakistan and uh, various ministries locally. I was just noting that our support for local food banks, the large blue bucket back there is quite full. Lynn, it's, it's awesome how much food has been gathered for, we support two food banks in the area, one in Westchester and one in Chester uh, at City Team Ministries. So we appreciate, now that we're back together, we have been on YouTube only for the last couple Sundays. So wonderful to be back together and just remind you that uh, you're able to bring canned goods, non-perishables in, and we'll see that they get to people that are hungry for them. Amen. But if you are watching on YouTube and you'd like to support our ministries, you can go to our website, www.nhfchurch.com, and you'll see right where you can click and uh, be led to the donation page, either to mail in a check to the church office or to give through PayPal, and we do appreciate that. And Father, we thank you again, and uh, just bless each and every offering that comes in today or that comes in on other days, Lord. And, and we by no means take that giving for granted. We are humbled by it. We're so appreciative of it. And I believe it's also our duty, a blessed duty, but a duty nonetheless to bless the seed that has been sown, that you would multiply it back to the givers, not only in terms of financial needs that they may have, but to meet the larger needs of their families, amen, for healing, for salvation in its fullness, Lord, that you would touch each and every family represented in the giving here today and throughout the week. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's get into God's Word today, which, as I said, I'm, I'm pretty much always very excited about it. But uh, today, you know, whenever you, you come around to uh, a holiday, Resurrection Sunday, you know, you consider messages that you've given before, and uh, there, there are certain truths about Easter that the Resurrection Sunday that you want to celebrate. Of course, the resurrection, quite obviously, and, and how we share in that. Uh, but the Lord kind of gave me a different approach to those truths today, and I'm excited to share that with you. We've been talking these last couple of Sundays uh, about Mount Zion, and specifically are our, our calling as citizens of Zion uh, to be those that, from that place of intimacy that Zion is all about, that uh, we would be those who would proclaim God's word, right? Would, would pray and release God's word over those that don't know him yet. 
and that we would then, as we proclaim his word, be available to share his word with people. And one of the methodologies that I've shared with you many times, is I call it prayer evangelism, which is the idea of, of before sharing God's word, you invite people to receive prayer, ask them if they have a prayer need. And that is the methodology we used in the streets of Phoenixville. And out of that, uh, God brought many hundreds of people to the Lord and started a Spanish church, which is thriving. But we've used that methodology in every culture that we've ministered in. Because how many of you know people have prayer needs? No matter what language they speak, no matter how much money they make, no matter what their situation. And I find that when you lead off with, do you have something I can pray about with you? I, I attend a church where we love to pray and God does great things as we pray. Do you have something I could pray about? So very seldom has anybody said, no, I'm great. Once in a while it happens, but not very often. And I find as you then pray for the need, and however you do it, everybody's going to pray differently. As you pray for that need, the presence of the Lord comes and touches that soul. And then I find often they're ready to hear the gospel or maybe just to receive a track or whatever, or maybe a hug, whatever the Lord prepares the way for. So I call that prayer evangelism. And we've been talking about uh, our responsibility as believers to pray for those who don't yet know him. And so we use the image of, of being on Mount Zion, lifted up in the presence and intimacy of the Lord, and from that position, declaring his word by faith over those that don't yet know him. Well, we're going to continue with that, but specifically focusing on the name of the Lord today. Remember I said the subtitle for today's message is, What's in a Name? And so we're going to look at that. So take a look at your scripture sheet. And by the way, also for those watching on YouTube, uh, if you go to our website, www.nhfchurch.com, and you'll see there my email. If you email me your email, we will include you in uh, the scripture sheet and the praise and worship sheet for uh, each and every Sunday. So you can uh, hopefully enter in more fully into the service if you're watching on YouTube. So joy and harvest from Mount Zion, talking about harvest. And uh, as I printed out there, we do mean Happy Resurrection Sunday. You'll hear me occasionally slip and call it Easter because that's just how I was raised. But uh, to me, it doesn't represent little uh, sweet bunnies and Easter egg hunts. When I think of Easter, I think of the resurrection of the Lord. Amen. So we're going to celebrate that today and talk about that in terms of what's in a name. And we're going to look at that in a minute. Happy Resurrection Sunday on Mount Zion. And you remember we talked about uh, the word Zion or Zion in Hebrew, right? Um, it literally means in Hebrew a fortress, a monument, or something set up. And I love that. I love that. So we talked about a fortress. God is our refuge. Zion represents intimacy. In fact, anytime you see the word Zion in the Old or New Testament, if you substitute the word intimacy, the passage will just really open up beautifully to you. Amen. So Zion is all about our intimacy with the Lord. And as we focus on intimacy, then he works through that intimacy. He makes us pregnant as his bride and then begins to give birth as a result of that intimacy to his work in the world. Amen. So Zion literally means a fortress. So you think of God as our refuge. Amen. A monument. A monument is something that reminds us of something that happened. So the monument that is reminding us here is it's the monument reminding us of Jesus' sacrifice and of his glorious resurrection, which is what we celebrate today. I, when I see that word or phrase, a monument, referring to what Zion means, I think of Jesus referring to the communion supper, which we'll celebrate in a little while, saying, do this in remembrance of me. Make this a monument, right? And then Zion also means something set up. I love that. In this case, the setup is you. So Zion represents something that God does, right? It, it's God as our fortress. God who makes a monument to who Jesus is to, that will never forget what Jesus has accomplished. But then the last aspect of Zion is something set up. In other words, it's something that God does that we can't do for ourselves. And that's what we're going to talk about today when we look at what's in a name. So it's something set up. For us watchmen and watchwomen on the walls, and you remember the image of being a watchman or a watchwoman was the idea of being on Zion's hill and fully uh, inflamed with the intimacy with the Lord and from that position of intimacy, declaring his word, declaring his name over family members, 
neighbors and nations that don't yet know him. That is part of our calling, and, and dare I say, part of our privilege, part of our anointing, but also part of our responsibility to not, to not see uh, our walk with Yeshua, with Jesus, as just being kind of a, a country club where we seek how to get all of our own needs met and, and leave it at that. God loves to meet our needs, but God desires this greater watchmen and watchwomen vision that we're on the wall, we're, we're seated in the heavenly places in Christ, and I, to, for which I say, for, for what purpose? Well, number one, intimacy with him, but number two, that we, as the watchmen and women, would proclaim from that position of intimacy. We would proclaim his word and proclaim his names over those that we know that don't yet know him. Amen? That's the authority. And that's also our responsibility. So that's where the next phrase comes from. Hearts are prepared for salvation by praise, prayer, and declaration on Mount Zion. What we found in our street ministry is that the more passionate the praise and worship in the Sunday morning service, the more souls we were able to reach Sunday afternoon on the streets. There was a direct correlation between passion and entering into praise and going out then and sharing the gospel with people on the streets. I remember one day I did a sermon on shouting in the Lord. The power, you know, there are many places where the Lord says shout. Shout unto the Lord, right? And uh, we do that sometimes. We'll shout hallelujah or uh, sometimes as a, a great burst of praise comes forth. But I remember one Sunday I taught on the power of the shout of the Lord and we had nine people receive the Lord on the streets that day. Amen? There's a direct correlation. In fact, if you understand, why did God go to such the trouble in the Old Testament to connect praise with harvest? Do you notice that? Why was praise and harvest inseparable? Because Praise and worship prepares in the heavenlies the harvest that we then walk out in, in obedience in the natural world. Amen. How many of you know there's a battle? There's a battle going on in the spiritual realm. Why do you share Jesus with some people and they have no interest in it? Why are they, blind? Why are they blinded? Why are they resistant to it? Well, it's because there's a spiritual battle going on. And praise and worship, declaration from Mount Zion, prepares the heavenlies for the harvest in the natural, which is where that statement comes from. Hearts are prepared for salvation by praise, prayer, and declaration on Mount Zion. Today we're going to focus, we focused last week on the power of declaring God's word. Today we're going to focus on a new name for a new creation, because we're also called to proclaim his names, which is what we do every time as we worship, isn't it? We praise the Lord, we'll sing songs, and then I invite you to proclaim his names and his titles, which is all a part of Zion life. It's all a part of what we're called to be as watchmen and women on the wall. Amen. So let's look at this more closely, and you're going to see that this matter of declaring a new name has been a, one of God's joys and passions and habits throughout the whole of the Bible. God just has a thing about taking people as they are, and renaming them. And when he renames them, the result is great fruitfulness. The result is transformation of the person, but it always leads to greater fruitfulness for his kingdom. Amen? So we're going to look at that today. But we start out uh, as we talk about a new name for a new creation. And by the way, uh, Easter, Resurrection Sunday is not a spectator sport. You're all included. Because God did not only speak a new name over several people that we're going to look at today, Bible characters, but he has spoken a new name over you. And you might say, well, when did that happen? As far as I know, I'm still called David and Susan and Peter and Wendy. Well, yes, but we're also called believers in Yeshua. We have been, we have been marked with the name of Yeshua. He has declared a new name over us. He's said, you're a new creation. Old things are passed away. When did that happen? When you cried out to Yeshua to be your Savior and the name of Jesus was spoken over you, you became a new creation. In fact, we who call ourselves Christians and they're Messianic believers who call themselves Messianic believers, it's all believing in Yeshua. But think about the word Christian. What does that mean? It means you have been anointed with the anointing of Jesus Christ. The name of Jesus has been spoken over you. Whether you're a believer in Yeshua or a Christian, whatever the terminology you're more comfortable with, the reality is the Father has spoken the name of his Son over you, 
And all that you were has now been transformed into all that he is. In fact, Orthodox Christians have a, a remarkably radical statement that they make, which I love. They said, Jesus became all that we are, right? That we might become all that he is. Right? Remember what Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Amen? Jesus became all that we were, so we might become all that he is, transformed into his likeness. You know, it says in 1 John 3, we know not what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Amazing, amazing truth. As I said, Resurrection Sunday is not a spectator sport, it's a participatory event. Amen? So look at Isaiah 62, one of my, as I said, when, when I get up in, into heaven, after having quite a time with Jesus, I look forward to, I, I want to sit down with Isaiah. I, he and I are just going to have pita bread and hummus or something and just sit down together. Because you know what I want to ask Isaiah about? How much of what you wrote did you really understand? Now he gets it all. But it, wouldn't that be fascinating to know as you, as you were bringing forth these amazing scriptures about Messiah, how much of it did you really understand of what you were saying? Well, let's take a look at one of those passages I will definitely ask him about. Isaiah 62, verse 1. And the start here is God speaking. He says, For Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. God is speaking ever from the heavenly Zion. And so he invites the people of God to speak from that place of intimacy. He says, I love this. He says, I will not hold my peace, which is a nice way of saying I will never stop proclaiming. What's he proclaiming? He says, and for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a lamp that burns. But that word salvation there is that Hebrew word Yeshua. It's virtually identical to Jesus' first name. It means the same thing. It's not the name form of the word, but it's, it, you can even hear the sound. It's Yeshua. That's how you say it. So look what the Lord says. He's never going to stop proclaiming until the righteousness of God's people, the Jewish people, as they awaken to Mashiach, to Messiah. And look what he says. And he's going to never stop proclaiming Yeshua as a lamp that burns. So the Lord is ever proclaiming the name of his son from that heavenly Zion, and he invites us to be those who would proclaim his name. Right? Declaring his name as we pray for people, but then sharing his name and witnessing as we go through our day. Amen? So look what he says. The Lord says, I'll never stop. He says, he will be proclaiming until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation, Yeshua, as a lamp that burns. The Gentiles shall see your righteousness. They'll not only hear about it, amen, but they'll see us living it. And all kings your glory. Now watch this. You shall be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord will name. Guess what? He just told you what that name was. He just said Yeshua. He just says he will continue to proclaim Yeshua as a lamp that burns. Hallelujah. He'll continue, continually be proclaiming Yeshua. And here he even tells us, you shall be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord will name. And then it just gets more radicaler and radicaler, more gloriousified and more gloriousified. Look what he says. You shall be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. A diadem is another form of, of a crown. And I love this. It, has, it can be worn kind of like a headband. It has all kinds of jewels in it. Amen? When God sp speaks his new name over you, Yeshua over you, you suddenly become enjeweled with the glistening beauty of the son of the living God. He takes, what, what does he do? He takes our ashes and turns them into beauty. He turns our darkness and heaviness and turns it into praise. Can you say amen? amen? So there's a new name that comes forth and he just told you, he gave a hint all the way back in Isaiah 62 of what that name would be, Yeshua, which the mouth of the Lord will name you shall also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. I love this. You shall no longer be termed forsaken, 
nor shall your land any more be termed desolate. So here's an interesting question. What, what have you been called through your lifetime? What Isaiah's, what Isaiah's writing is really acknowledging here, some of us have been forsaken and been called forsaken, rejected. And sometimes we've adopted that name for ourselves. Maybe it's failure. Maybe it's, oh, I'm a disappointment and my life is a disappointment. There's any manner of negative things that have spoken over us. And maybe, maybe a, an important question is, what do you speak over yourself? Are you speaking the new name that brings the new creation, Yeshua? Are you speaking his name? Are you speaking forsaken, desolate, rejected, forgotten? You see, there's all kinds of names that the world, the flesh, and the devil would impose on us. Poor, sick, depressed, right? And so a really important question to ask ourselves today as we talk about what's in a name. What are the names? What are the terms that we tend, maybe you don't speak it out loud, but thoughts. How do you think of yourself? What do you rehearse over and over again as your concept of who you are? The Lord says, no, I've spoken a new name over you this day. Man, we already read. Jesus humbled himself, became a man, humbled himself to the point of even the death of a cross. And in response to that, the Lord has given him a name which is above every name that every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, right? The Lord has been given the ultimate name. And how astonishing is it that then he gives us his new name, that we would bear that name, that we would begin, come on somebody, that we would begin to say about ourselves and each other what he has said about us. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, did you hear that? 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things are passed away. Old names are passed away. Old limiting concepts are passed away. And all things have become new. Why? Because you're in Christ. You have received a new name. Christian. Believer in Yeshua. Marked with the name. Amen. You shall be called by a new name, and I love this, which the mouth of the Lord will name. Listen to me. If the mouth of the Lord has named the name of Yeshua over you, that name is more powerful than every other limiting, hurtful name that's ever been spoken over you since you were young enough to remember. But here's the key. What names and titles do you speak over yourself in, in the hidden inner thoughts when no one is around to cheer you up, when no one is there to encourage you, here's my question. What do you remember over yourself? What do you speak over yourself in those moments? I pray that today there will be a switch. Amen? We'll begin to speak Yeshua over us. So look what it says. You shall no longer be termed forsaken. The Lord says forsake the forsakenness. Reject the rejection. Be willing to accept a new word, a new name, a new calling, a new title, a new possibility. That's what Resurrection Sunday is all about. You shall no longer be termed forsaken, nor shall your land any more be termed desolate, but you shall be called Hepzibah, and your land Beulah. Hepzibah means my delight is in her. Hallelujah. That's how God looks at Israel. That's how God looks at the Jewish people. That's how God looks at all of us who have been grafted into Yeshua by faith. Isn't that wonderful? In place of forsaken and rejected, God says, no, a million times no, my delight is in you. My delight rests upon you. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So instead of forsaken, you shall be called Hepzibah. My delight is in her and your land, Beulah. Beulah means married. Hallelujah. Instead of rejected, passed over, you will know that the Lord delights in you and that you are married. Are we not called the bride of Christ? Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on, somebody. It's okay to be happy on Resurrection Sunday. Yes, amen. God is talking about a name. He's talking about name changes here. Not that your name was Mr. or Mrs. Forsaken. He's not talking about the, the surname that you were born with. He's talking about the names you name over yourself from the history of how you have been treated and taught to see yourself. And God says, if it doesn't agree with my new name, Yeshua, reject it and embrace 
what I have spoken over you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. You're allowed to say thank you, Jesus. The ushers will not escort you out of here. For you shall be called Hephzibah. My delight is in her and your land Beulah, which means married. Look at this. For the Lord delights in you. Do you can you begin to speak that over yourself? Maybe life doesn't seem so delightful sometimes. But go ahead and speak over yourselves that new name. God calls you Hephzibah and Beulah. For the Lord delights in you and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a virgin, so shall your sons marry you. And I believe essentially what that's talking about is that our families will come into the kingdom. And I, I believe actually that you should be capitalized. I believe what it's really saying is that God intends, as, as we the people of Zion are declaring his word over our loved ones, declaring his name, Yeshua, over our loved ones, not going by what we see, not going by the limitations of their current behavior patterns or lack of faith perhaps, but being willing as, as God's people on Zion to declare his word prophetically. That's the watchman. Watchmen don't look at what is and settle for it. Watchmen look at what God says and proclaim it. Watchmen and women sitting on the wall, seated in the heavenly places in Christ, don't settle for the names that people name themselves if it's lesser than the name of Yeshua. But we are daring to declare, even over those struggling with addiction or depression or whatever it may be, we dare to declare the fullness of the name of Yeshua, and we expect to see transformation. And I believe we will. So shall your sons marry you. The, the suggestion there also uh, from the historical perspective of Israel, if your sons are marrying you, it means they've not been carried away captive, but they're back in the culture able to, to marry and participate in the life of the culture because they have been set free from captivity. That'll really preach too, won't it? Amen? For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a virgin, so shall your sons marry you. Now watch this. Here's the proof of what I just interpreted. As the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Hallelujah. Yes. We're talking about the bride of Christ here. God rejoices over us. And what did we say whenever you see the word Zion? Substitute intimacy. Right? God has called us to an intimacy, to a 24-7 fellowship intimacy with our husbandmen that he might ever be making us pregnant with his purpose, that we can be giving birth to Yeshua. There, therefore, you see that, that Mary, Jesus' mother, is not a one-time, one-off. She is a prototype. We are all meant to walk in intimacy with the Lord so he can be ever making us pregnant with his purpose, that we can give birth to Yeshua in our thoughts, words, and deeds. But how many of you know we've said this many times, without intimacy, there's no conception. Without conception, there's no gestation. Without gestation, there's no birthing. So it all comes back to our intimacy with the Lord being so central. But look at what God says, not, not Pastor Peter. I, I didn't say it first, he said it. I'm just repeating his words. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah, look what he says. As, and as a bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. I have set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem. Now wait a minute, it says, and they shall never hold their peace day or night. We started out with God saying he, he would never stop proclaiming Yeshua from his heavenly Zion. Now we find out that we as the people of Zion on earth are never supposed to hold our peace. We're always supposed to be proclaiming. Isn't that wonderful? God is ever proclaiming his word. He's ever proclaiming Yeshua from his heavenly Mount Zion. And then he says to us who would be watchmen and women on the walls, will you now never cease to proclaim in prayer and declaration my name? Don't settle for how that family member is acting or not acting. Proclaim my names over them. Declare who I am. Look what he says. So shall your God rejoice over you. I've set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem. They, that is we, shall never hold our peace. God never holds his. He says, don't ever stop proclaiming my word and my name over the, your neighbors and the nations, even over the most hopeless situations. They shall never hold their peace day or night. You who make mention of the Lord, do not keep silent. 
Who are those who make mention of the Lord? Those who declare his names. He says, don't keep silent. Never stop proclaiming and praising my names. Never stop being willing to share me with those that you meet along life's pathways. I love this. We shall never hold our peace day or night. You who make mention of the Lord, do not keep silent and give him no rest. I like that. Give him no rest till he establishes, until he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. Hallelujah. God says, I never stop proclaiming my word and my name even over the most hopeless among you. So why are you stopping? Don't give up. Keep proclaiming. That's what watchmen and women do. Amen. So I printed out a couple of examples of this because I really want you to catch the fire of the fact that God has spoken a new name over you. He's spoken the name of Yeshua. Jesus is your new identity. He's your new reality. And he wants you to forsake every other limiting, critical, holding back kind of name and embrace the fullness of his name today. Amen. Amen. And as I said before, Oh, hallelujah. When God declares a new name over you, you are changed. And every time God declares a new name over somebody, the result is fruitfulness. Isn't that wonderful? God wants to lift us all up from the level of fruitfulness in his kingdom that we have so far experienced. I'm not saying we haven't, but how many of you know there's more? Did you ever sense there's got to be more? Have you ever felt that in, in, in a service? There's more than this. I thank God for what we have, but there's more. How many can relate to that? There's more, there's more, there's more. I'm telling you that is a not misdirected expectation. There is more. And when God speaks a new name over somebody, they step into that greater vision. And that's why I want to encourage you today. Forsake, forsaken, right? Forsake desolate. No matter how forsaken or rejected or desolate life has been so far, God has a new name for you. He has a new destiny, a new purpose, a new breakthrough. That's what resurrection, listen, we've all felt at times kind of dead. <laughs> Amen? But God speaks over the graves of disappointment, discouragement. Some of you have been praying for loved ones for decades. And you get discouraged, you get run down. Well, I'm here today to proclaim the name of Yeshua over you, to proclaim the name of Jesus. I want to say, rise up. In fact, Jesus says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. That's Ephesians 5.14. Don't you love that? Jesus is talking to you today. <coughs> Jesus is speaking a new name over you. He's saying, why settle for the limitations and the hindrances and the frustrations in your family? We prayed for families earlier. Or, or whatever situation you find yourself in, God says, I'm speaking a new name over you today. The name of Yeshua overcomes every other limiting word and name. So I gave you a few examples here. And don't worry, we're not going to do all these scriptures today. Uh, some of it's for next week. But I, I just printed out a couple of them, and some of you reminded me of others. Th these are name changes in the Bible. Uh, remember, Abram was Abram, and then God made him Abraham. Abram means exalted father. Abraham means father of a multitude. Right? So he was pretty special before God breathed. In fact, I heard one Messianic teacher say it was as if the ha, God breathed. God breathed. Abram was exalted. He was wonderful. But then God breathed on him, and he, Abram became Abraham, Abraham, right? The breath of God. And that took him from being exalted father, Abram, to father of a multitude. Fruitfulness. Do you see what happened? He, he was all that in a bag of chips already. He was wonderful. But then God said, no, I'm going to change your name, because when I breathe on you the breath of life and I give you a new name, there's a whole new fruitful. Oh, come on, somebody. Do you hear me today? God has spoken a new name over you. Forsake desolate, right? Forsake, forsaken, and embrace the new name that he has spoken over you. So how about Hosea to Yehoshua? Uh, Yehoshua is Joshua, right? You, you're not used to that saying it, but that's Hosea was salvation. We talked about this. We're studying a, a through the Bible course. We're in studying Joshua. Uh, Joshua's original name was Hosea. Hosea means salvation. But Moses, under the anointing of God, changed it to Yehoshua, which means Yahweh is salvation. Hello. Amen? 
So he had a wonderful name. He also was all that in a bag of chips. He had a wonderful name, Hosea, salvation. But Moses needed to under, him to understand by the name change, there was a revelation of God's ability to save that Joshua by himself could never have. So he went from Hosea, salvation, to Yehoshua, Yahweh, is salvation. And as we've said before, Yehoshua in the Hebrew ear is a little bit uncomfortable to the sound. So they contracted Yehoshua to Yeshua, which is there again, the name Jesus. Joshua is actually has the same name as Jesus, Yeshua. And what a picture. Moses, can, Moses law can get you to the outskirts of the promised land, but he can't take you into the kingdom. He can bring you to the, outs, to the suburbs, but, it, but it's, it's left for Yehoshua, Joshua, Jesus, to bring us in. Amen. Oh, these names, do you see what happened? And how many of you know Joshua was pretty fruitful? He fought over 30 enemy armies. Not bad. Fruitfulness comes when your name is changed. And I'm telling you, your name has already been changed, but the enemy doesn't want you to focus on it. Well, Pastor Peter's going to shout and dance until you do. There's been a new name spoken over you. He told you in the beginning, Yeshua shall go forth as a lamp that burns. And I will never stop. God says, I will never stop proclaiming the name of Yeshua over you until you are transformed into that new creation. And then later he says, the watchmen and women on the wall will never stop proclaiming the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Over one another. How about this one? Um, before, uh, before Hosea and Yehoshua... Um, Janet reminded me of Jacob, Jacob and Israel. Jacob means supplanter or deceiver. Israel, what a, to talk about a change, literally means he shall be a prince with God. Woo! That's pretty good. Supplanter, remember he grabbed Esau by the heel, yeah. right? To try to rob him, cheat him, right? Eventually Esau, what did he, he sold his birthright for what? A pot of Lentils. I don't even like lentils that much. Come on, somebody. Amen? Even if they're prepared well, they're not that exciting to me. Right? But the idea is the name change. Here, here is Jacob. Here is Jacob, supplanter, deceiver. And then God said, speaks over him, and a new name comes, Prince with God. Israel. Hallelujah. Woo, hallelujah. Oh, amen. How about... Uh, the Lord quickened me. He said, you, you don't have any ladies in there. What's wrong with you? So, of course, where did I go to? We just celebrated Purim, right? So, um, Esther was Hadassah. Hadassah in, in Hebrew means myrtle. And myrtle, myrtle is a beautiful, it, it represents beauty. It can represent uh, authority. It, it's, a, it's all that in a bag of chips. It was beautiful, wonderful, right? Hadassah, myrtle. Uh, represents also God's desire to bless his people. It's a very symbolic tree in the Old Testament. But then, what, what, what did she become? Esther. Esther means star, like, a, like the sun. Star. It, it, it's, it's from the Persian language, Estara. So her name, nothing wrong with, with Hadassah Myrtle, it's beautiful, but she became a star. She, she shined the glory of the Lord and, and brought deliverance to her people, which we just celebrated at Purim, right? Mm -hmm. Name change. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. And, and there, there's a couple more here. And don't worry, I'm not going to go much further than this, and I knew that, that I wouldn't. But how about, how about another one? Peter, Jesus called him rock. Right? He gave him a new name. Remember, Peter means small skipping stone. The, the word he used for rock means a foundation stone upon which you can build something. Ha! Woo! Talk about fruitfulness. Little skipping stone. You are Peter, Greek. Little skipping stone. And on this rock, he says, I just gave you, you are a foundation stone because when I come to live inside you, I will turn all your weakness into strength and you are going to be somebody I can build upon. Fruitfulness. Amen? Oh, there's so many more. How about Saul to Paul? Um, Saul means something asked for. Like, like if, if a mother was, was praying for a baby, 
right? That's what, what the idea of Saul is, like something asked for. And I think about Paul's life and how he was diligently seeking, right, for all the wrong things, right? He, he was going after believers and imprisoning them. They say he had a particular delight in, uh, in arresting believing families and dispersing them, separating them in judgment. Um, so what was his name changed to Paul? What does Paul mean? Something a little, <laughs> something small. He went from, I'm pursuing, I'm pursuing God in all the wrong ways and, and imprisoning his people and creating havoc in the church. I've asked for that, I'm going for it. No, now I'm just Paul, something a little, right? I'm so little that God can be great through me. What a transformation, amen? And, and there's so many, more, so many more of these. This is, this is 20 sermons in and of itself. But how about Jesus? We already read that, that he was given the name above every name, but, but think about the name he had before he was proclaimed glorious resurrected king, right? Criminal, defeated, crucified, loser. Even his own disciples were overwhelmed, overcome with grief and fear. We thought he was gonna you know, overthrow the Romans and, and take the throne, right? But Jesus received a new name, the name which is above every name, right? That every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. Amen? So God, it even says that Jesus was raised by the glory of the Lord. And we know that glory in Greek originally meant a viewer opinion. So Jesus was actually raised by the opinion of the Father. The whole world said, you're defeated, you're crucified, you're a loser, your followers are, followers are scattered, nothing's ever going to come of this so-called movement. Right? But the Father said, no, I speak over him, resurrected, eternally living, King of kings, Lord of lords, who shall reign forever from the heavenly Mount Zion and one day shall come back and reign from the earthly Zion. The Lord says, I proclaim my king, my son, who will reign forever and ever and ever. And what the Lord renamed is, what the Lord renamed overcame every other name. Remember, they scoffed at him, right? And they said, he's, you know, he saved others, let him, oh, so you're the king of kings? Well, save yourself. Right up to the last moment, he heard the lies and, and the, the conjecturing and the limiting, cursing, cutting words. In fact, it's said that uh, he was ring. Uh, they talk about uh, bulls of Bashan. You, you've heard that? And do you ever wonder what that was? I was really studying into it. I believe what that represents. It, it says he was encircled right by the bulls of Bashan, which, which represent uh, very hardy cattle. Um, but in context, I believe what it represents, and I had a picture of this one day in prayer, I believe it represents that Jesus in the spirit was ringed about by every evil spirit you can imagine, and that they hurled at him every curse that they could think of, said, we got him where we want him now. I hurl on to you, suppose it's son of God, I hurl on to you depression, cancer, uh, every rejection, every poverty. I believe they cursed him with every curse. They ringed about him in the spirit. You couldn't hear it or see it, but I believe Jesus could. And when the last curse was spoken over him, remember it's written, he was made a curse for us. When the very last curse was spoken, I believe that's when Jesus said, I got it. I got the last one. It is finished. <laughs> <laughs> every lying, cutting name and word and curse was spoken over him. And when he had taken it all, then the Father began to speak. Jesus went down into the belly of hell, but hell couldn't hold him because he was without sin. He is the everlasting Son of God. And I believe from that position, he led captivity captive. All those that were in Abraham's bosom, he led up. Abraham's bosom was that place where the, where the righteous dead waited for Messiah. He led them up took captivity captive in glory, but I believe that the ensuing power, the launching force, was what the Father spoke over the Son. He said, you are the risen Savior. The enemy says he's got you where he wants you, but hell can't hold you. Death and the grave can't hold you. I speak over you. Hallelujah. What no man can take away. You are Yeshua, 
my eternal reigning son. And I believe on the force of that renaming, Jesus shot up like a rocket. Right, he came up and spent 40 days with his disciples and then ascended. But as I close, and there's so much more to say about this, but we're going to take communion. And I, and I don't want to go longer, though I surely would like to. Hallelujah. But I want to tell you today, the bottom line is, you have been named with a new name. And Jesus so desires that you accept that name and begin to declare it over yourself. Declare it over your loved ones, believing that that name will not return void. Amen? And we're going to celebrate <laughs> communion together. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Spirit. And uh, rather than doing doing a song today, um, we have something else that we're, we're going to do. Um, but uh, Herbert Jana, you can get, get ready. And uh, we will wait to distribute until I share just one last uh, blessing. Thank you, Lord, for the power of your name. And as we, as we prepare to celebrate communion. I just have a little thing I want to do before we distribute. I just want to encourage anybody watching on YouTube today, if you have never trusted in Jesus, whose name we've been sharing today is, is Yeshua, uh, if you have never asked Jesus to, to be your Savior and to uh, rename you from maybe the hurts and limitations and, and sins of your past into a new name, as we said, which the name of the Lord will utter. He will declare the name of his son over you. If you would like to make sure that you're trusting in Yeshua and Jesus in that way, let's bow our heads and, and pray together. You can just pray this with me very, very simply. Just say this with me. Heavenly Father, I've sinned and broken your laws. I need a Savior. I believe that Jesus is my Savior. God Almighty, God Almighty, who came to earth as a man, died on the cross for my sins, and was raised from the dead. And was raised from the dead. Come into my heart, Lord. Into my heart. Forgive my sins. Forgive my sins. Grant, me Grant me eternal life. Speak your name, Jesus. Speak your name, Jesus. The name of Yeshua, the name of Yeshua. Over, me over me this day. And may I ever be speaking your name. Over myself, over myself and those I pray for. Those I pray for. In, Jesus name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Before you distribute, I thought I would uh, just apply to you uh, what I've been talking about today and, and just encourage you, those watching on YouTube and those present, I just want to speak over you uh, some of the I am's of the Lord. And I just encourage you to just, just to close your eyes. This will just take a few moments, but I'd like communion to be fresh and anointed each time, that that it would never ever be just something that we repeat and, and, and methodically go through. I want it to be fresh and new and alive. So I've been talking with you today about the power of God renaming. And uh, so I want to speak some of his I am's over you because there's such a powerful revelation. The name of Jesus is so full, Yeshua is so full it would take, well, people, men have written thousands of books about the name <laughs> because it, the name is so full you can, can barely encapsulate it in 20 sermons. But I'm gonna try <laughs> in just a few moments just to speak some of the, the I am's of the Lord over you. I want to mark you, uh, not only uh, for today as we celebrate Resurrection Sunday, but all through this year, and as you go forth sharing his word and his name with others, Lord, I just declare over us today the name of Yeshua, and for those who perhaps have received you for the first time on our YouTube channel, we welcome them into your family and into your kingdom. And so I speak the names of the Lord, the I am's of God over you. Just, just be in a receptive mode and, and just allow the Holy Spirit to minister this to you and then we'll seal it by taking communion together. Jesus, you are the great I am, amen. And as I say these, you'll feel the anointing of the Lord because God moves to cause his name to come alive. Just you can say thank you, Lord, or whatever reaction feels natural to you, but just allow these names to take 
hold in you. Jesus, you are the great I am. Yeshua HaMashiach. Hashem, the name, Yeshua. I am that I am. Haya, Asher Haya. And you remember that Jesus at one point said to them in Matthew 16, 15, but who do you say that I am? And by the way, the sheet of all these I am's I'm reading over you is right back there. Help yourself to them as you leave. Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? I love that. And I want to say, Lord, here's who I say that you am. Hallelujah. Jesus said, I am your way, your truth, and your resurrection life. Now, just receive it. Say, thank you, Jesus, and receive it. Jesus said, I am your forgiveness and ability to forgive. I am your living righteousness. Hallelujah. I am your destiny fulfillment. I am your open door. The Lord names his names over you today, dear ones. He says, I am your dwelling place in all generations. I am your protection and shield. Amen. Don't we need that in this day? He says, I am your total freedom, deliverance, and victory. I am your strength and miracles. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. We need miracles in this day. He says, I am your peace in Sabbath rest, the fullness of shalom. I think I need a double dose of that one. I am your peace, the Lord says. I am your peace in Sabbath rest, the fullness of shalom. I am Yahweh Shema, ever with you and in you and for you, Emmanuel. Do you like that one? I am Yahweh Shema, ever with you and in you and for you, Emmanuel. I am your healing and health. I am your abundant wealth and perfectly timed prosperity and wisdom in stewardship. Boy, that's an important one. I am your abundant wealth and perfectly timed prosperity and wisdom in stewardship. In other words, in receiving and in giving. I am your kingdom fruitfulness. Remember we said when God renames you, it's to bring you to a new place of fruitfulness. I am your favor and everlasting mercy. I am your wisdom and Christ mind in all things and convicting power. I am your saving love and light. Can you say amen? amen. I am your saving love and light, your bright and morning star. Let me say that last. Just receive this with me today. I am, the Lord says, I am your saving love and light, your bright and morning star. And what is there left to say? But thank you, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, Yeshua. Amen. Herb and Janet, you can pass out the elements if you would. And just hold on to them and we'll partake together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I will many times, many a time, take those I am's and, and proclaim them over you and your families. I'll proclaim them over my prayer list. And it is so powerful. Remember the Lord says, I will never hold my peace for proclaiming Yeshua. And then he says, please, don't you ever hold your peace and cease from proclaiming the name of the Lord. Thank you, sister. Jesus. Thank you, Herb. That's awesome. It's sitting on the Bible. That's a good place for it. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So, Lord, we bless these elements that we're about to partake of. We're so amazed, Lord at the power of your renaming. And today we want to fully enter in to the power that you have named the name of your son, Yeshua, Jesus, over us. We want to step out of the limitation of every false word, every false determination, every limiting word that's ever been spoken over us. We reject them today. Amen. Can you say amen? amen. We reject every name and word that is lesser than the fullness of what you have named over us and calling us new creations in Christ Jesus. And Jesus took bread, he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. 
Do this in remembrance of me. Let us take and receive. And Lord, as we prepare to partake, remembering the power of your shed blood, as we have already prayed and affirmed together, we have chosen to turn away from our sins. Amen. We acknowledge our need for a Savior and have confessed so. And now, Lord, as we partake of the blood, we remember together that you also desire that we be willing to turn away from everything that the Bible calls sin. And I thank you so much, Lord, that you will empower us. Hallelujah. By the power of this new name, Jesus, that has been proclaimed over us. How many of you know it's the name that's above every name? Say amen. amen. The name of Yeshua is above cancer. It's above depression. It's above every sin that can be named, every addiction that the enemy could put upon us. The name of Jesus is our victory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Then Jesus took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to them saying, drink from it all of you for this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let us take and drink unto forgiveness, healing, restoration, and revival. Amen. Amen. We thank you for joining us here. All those on YouTube. And I just close with the blessing, Lord. You taught Moses and Aaron. And I just say each of you today, by the name of Yeshua, by the name of Jesus, I proclaim over you and your families, the Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you, his lovely face, his presence, his living name. Hallelujah. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you and your families everlastingly his shalom. In Yeshua's name, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us. We'll continue with the study next week.